When Freud wrote his essay on group psychology, the First World War had just ended in the autumn of 1918. In 1919, the Versailles Treaty followed, and the Austrian Republic was proclaimed in 1920. In Germany, Hitler was beginning to make use of the essay, The Stormtroopers, and Mussolini was gathering the Fasci di Combattimento, the fighting leagues that gave their name to fascism. Freud's essay foreshadows the growth of fascist movements in Europe in providing some key concepts to allow us to understand the potentially destructive dynamics of masses and the ties between us. Slightly more than 100 years since its publication in 1921, at the reopening of the Freud Museum in Vienna, we find ourselves in a new crisis, in the aftermath of a pandemic with a war in Europe and with fascist movements and parties that have gathered strength in several European countries and beyond. These descriptions are once again highly relevant. The dominant mode of thinking in a neoliberal age is what John Rickman would call one-person psychology, about one individual as conceived of in isolation. Other people are added on later as an afterthought, resulting in what Adorno called the coldness of the isolated competitor, who would like to escape this condition, but cannot insofar as he or she is also its product. When Freud described psychoanalysis as the third blow to man's narcissism, wrote Rickman, there was left a hope fostered perhaps by a remaining shred of that same self-concern that if he knew himself better, he would attain the mastery of the forces within. But suppose a study of group dynamics shows us how we more than the children of our time and generation are indeed its slaves, that we in fact ruled from without by group forces of which we're unaware that non-narcissism would get another nasty blow. It's to some extent implicit in Freud that these social forces are there already. In the individual's mental life, somebody else is invariably involved as a model, as an object, as a helper, as an opponent. And so from the very first, individual psychology is at the same time social psychology as well. To understand the frightening world we live in, we need to be able to think from the point of view of groupings, of the complexities of affective ties and identifications between and within us. A group, read Freud, is clearly held together by a power of some kind, and to what power can the feet be better ascribed than to Eros, which holds together everything in the world? He goes on to suggest that if an individual gives up his distinctiveness in a group and lets his other members influence him by suggestion, it gives the impression that he does it because he feels the need of being in harmony with them rather than in opposition to them. So perhaps, after all, he does it in and zu Liebe. So what's in the nature of Eros? In Plato's Symposium, Socrates conveys to the other guests the wisdom passed on to him by Diotima. Eros is love of what he lacks. This is neither wise and beautiful nor ugly and bad but something in between these extremes. When Aphrodite was born, the gods held a banquet at which one of the guests was resource, the son of ingenuity. When they finished eating, poverty came begging, as you would expect, there being plenty of food, and hung around the doorway. Resource was drunk, so he went into Zeus gardens and was overcome by sleep. Poetry, seeing here the solution to her own lack of resources, decided to have a child by him. So she lay with him and conceived Eros. Thus we learn that Eros is always poor and needy. Barefoot and unkempt, he sleeps on the street in doorways. At the same time, he's brave, enterprising and determined, a magician and a thinker. He's a spirit in between gods and humans, whom one on the same day can be alive and flourishing and at death's door. This tale foreshadows Freud's exposition of emotional ambivalence. 